On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. And welcome to About Books. In a few minutes, we'll chat with the founder of a small publishing house that recently won a very big award. But first, here's some of the latest news from the publishing world. Well, there's been dozens of books written about the life and legacy of former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who died at the end of November. But one group was waiting until Mr. Kissinger's passing to release its assessment of the man who guided foreign policy for Presidents Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford. Jacobin Magazine, which describes itself as offering, quote, socialist perspectives on politics and culture, announced the release of The Good Die Young on November 29th. That's the same day that the 100-year-old Mr. Kissinger died at his home in Connecticut. Quote, Kissinger's death has rid the world of a homicidal manager of American power, and we intend to dance on his grave. That's from an excerpt of the book. It goes on to say, quote, we prepared a book for this occasion, a catalog of Kissinger's dark accomplishments over the course of a long career in public carnage. In other news, Axios financial correspondent Felix Salmon recently compared the book sales of Walter Isaacson's biography of Elon Musk and Michael Lewis's book on the rise and fall of crypto entrepreneur Sam Bankman Fried. He called the closely timed release of the two books, quote, the great business book matchup of 2023. Over the first eight weeks of sales, nearly 230,000 copies of Mr. Isaacson's Elon Musk were sold. That compares to just 73,000 copies of Mr. Lewis's Going Infinite over its first eight weeks. Quote, the verdict is in now, Mr. Salmon wrote, Walter Isaacson by a mile. And finally, one story about state laws on access to books in public school libraries. Penguin Random House has joined a federal lawsuit challenging legislation passed in Iowa earlier this year that prohibits books featuring descriptions of sex in K-12 classrooms and libraries. Penguin Random House noted that in at least one Iowa school district, students now no longer have access to work such as Toni Morrison's Beloved, James Joyce's Ulysses, William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, and Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. The chief legal officer at Penguin Random House said in a statement announcing its filing, quote, this country has long upheld the principle that authors have the right to communicate their stories and ideas to the public, including students, and that students have a right to explore, choose, and learn from those books without discriminatory interference from the government. Statutes like the one in Iowa undermine these important rights and wrongfully subject librarians and educators and school districts to penalty just for doing their jobs, end quote. And now an interview with Transit Books publisher Adam Levy. Mr. Levy recently sat down with Book TV's Peter Slen to talk about the publishing house that he began with his wife out of their home eight years ago and what it means to have published a 2023 Nobel Prize winner. And now on Book TV, we want to introduce you to Adam Levy. He is the co-publisher, along with his wife Ashley, of Transit Books, Mr. Levy, what kind of books do you publish at Transit? Um, Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, We publish primarily international literature. We're an independent publishing house based here um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. We publish uh, a carefully curated list of really excellent literature from around the world, both uh, literature for adults and also recently uh, literature for children as well with a new children's book imprint that we've started. Now, when did you get the idea to focus on international? Um, I, th- th- that was very, that was a, a long time in the making. Ashley and I met in a writing program at Columbia University. Um, she she is a writer herself, and I started at that time as a translator. We were getting to know these different worlds and corners of the publishing industry. Um, and then later, we, we both found work in the publishing industry in New York. And I think we started to see how much literature was coming through and what was also being left behind, what was being overlooked by the corporate houses. Um, and we saw an opportunity there for works that 
Um, we could champion and connect with readers, booksellers, um, critics, and we saw we saw an opportunity for for uh, a list of our own, and that's that's the those were the the original seeds of of the press. Well, I've kind of buried the lead here, Mr. Levy, but the Washington Post recently had a headline, one of my favorite headlines of all time. This <laughs> couple just published a Nobel winner from their living room. It's true. Tell, tell us the story. <laughs> well, we started the publishing house after we moved out to the San Francisco Bay Area um, in 2015. Um, at that time, we both held full-time jobs, um, you know, to afford the rest of our lives. And um, we got in the habit of working on the press uh, in the margins of the day. So in the morning before work, in the evenings, on weekends, on vacations, and this was kind of just the way that it um, we had assimilated the press into our lives or we had assimilated our lives into the press. Um, and the two have always kind of been uh, intertwined ever since. So, yeah, we, we've we've operated the press out of the house since 2015. And um, since then, you know, I've left my job and spend my time, my days with transit. But um, those days are also spent in the house. Um, there's there's been some I think that the pandemic also changed things for us because there was a time beforehand where, you know, we were we were somewhat cagey about the fact that we didn't have an office. Sometimes an agent would come out to, to visit or um, an editor or a writer and they would ask to visit our offices and we would say, how we meet at a cafe or something, something like that. And we we would take all of our meetings just um you know, in Oakland, where we were living at the time. Uh, but now with with remote work, it's actually, it's kind of been somewhat advantageous for us. We, we've spread out a little bit. Um, we have coworkers in LA and New York, and we're here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So it's, it's allowed us to be a little bit more flexible um, in terms of the kind of uh, work culture and office life that, we, that we're able to support. So how big is Transit? How many employees at this point? And how many books do you publish a year? Uh, we're four. We're four of us, and we publish um, historically. We publish six to eight books a year. This year we're doing eight, and next year we're going to be increasing it to about twelve, uh, and seeing how that feels. But uh, ideally, we're, we'll be at this kind of one book a month uh, um, cadence. And what we find is that really allows us to focus a lot of attention on all of our books on the front list and also our books on the back list and to give them the attention that they deserve and not just have them, you know, pop in week after week and then uh, forget them as soon as uh, the primary sales window closes. So how did you convince Mr. Levy, that first author, to join you <laughs> at Transit when your competition is what, Simon & Schuster, Penguin yeah. Random House, et cetera, et cetera? That's a good question. I, you know, I, I because I had a start as a translator, I, I kind of came up with a network of translators. And I wrote to a translator who I really admired. Her name is Lisa Dillman. Um, she's the translator of writer like uh, Yuri Herrera and Pilar Quintana. And I wrote to her and said, we're thinking about starting a publishing house um, do you think you have some kind of book that has been passed over by another house for being too long or too short or too strange or too hard or too something? Um, and I'd be curious to read it. And she sent us um, what would become our, the first book that we published, uh, Such Small Hands by the Spanish writer Andres Barba. Um, and it turned out that it was too short for the commercial houses that she had sent it to. Also a little too strange. It's kind of like a Shirley Jackson crossed with uh, the Virgin Suicides um, about a young girl at an orphanage. Um, and, it's, and it kind of alternates perspectives between um, this choral we of the other girls in the orphanage and, this, and the, the, the recent arrival. And it's a very eerie, haunting, um, very Halloween appropriate book. And we loved it. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant, really taut, slim book that um, we thought would be the right one to to 
kickstart our list, list with. And so we we made the case, you know, that we were new press that were um, that was going to be enthusiastic champions of this kind of work. Um, and yeah, we were really lucky that Lisa was on board and Andres um, and his Spanish pub- publisher were also on board. And uh, we had a great success with it. Now, let's get to the second half of that headline. Yeah. Publishing a Nobel Prize winner. Tell us that story. Um, yeah, well, Ashley and I were admirers of Jan Foss's work um, uh, before we first saw his, his um, what would become his masterwork, Septology on Submission. And so we received about 30 pages, typically with... Um, uh international literature you're not reading a full manuscript on submission in the way that you are with an english language manuscript you're you're seeing just a sample of it and sometimes a synopsis but usually it's just a short um chunk of pages so we read the first 30 pages of what we were told was going to be uh, a 1200 page book of of slow prose um by Jan Fossa, who we were we were great admirers of, but this was going to be a departure from some of his previous shorter works. This had a, a really kind of tight, more economical um, structure. And we read it. We fell in love with this rhythm of these uh, sentences that meander and come back to a point and then take off again and then come back to that same point. Um, there was something really hypnotic about the prose that we fell in love with. And I think you know, one of the advantages of being a house of our size is that we can take these risks um, on projects that we feel really passionately about without needing, you know, a sales team and a marketing team um, to whisper their better better judgment in, in our ear. And we decided to sign the three books that comprise the Septology um, all at once and then started publishing them uh, in consecutive years from 2020 uh 2020 on what was the reaction or what was the response to the first in this trilogy well it, it, we published it into a strange moment we published the first volume the other name uh in april of 2020 so this was right at the start of the pandemic we i was terrified actually we all these books had gone out um almost at the same time that bookstores were um, were closed. We didn't know whether the bookstores, I mean, the books were going to arrive at just, you know, shuttered stores and come back to us as returns. Um, books are returnable uh, items, so they're credited as sales when, when a store purchases them, but they have the ability to return them and then have those sales credited back to the publisher. So... Um, we we were terrified. We were lucky. We were lucky in some respects. That first volume was long listed for the International Booker Prize, um, but I think it was always our plan with the uh, with the Septology to build up a following um, and to make sure that with each volume we could find more readers for it. We could find more critics who could champion it. Um, we we really wanted this to be. Uh, I mean, for, for a house. For a house like ours, without a big marketing budget, without, you know, the ability to do a splashy campaign. Um, And also with a writer like um, Jan, who is himself, um, you know, he's somewhat reclusive. He he doesn't like to travel. He doesn't like to give interviews. Um, We knew that we would really have to kind of be his spokespeople here um, in North America. So we found that, you know, with each successive volume, we were able to uh, gain more of a following. But his breakout year was certainly um, in 2022 with the, the release of the third volume, which um, really received wonderful critical acclaim. It was a finalist for the International Booker Prize, for the National Book Award, um, and for the National Book Critics Circle uh, Award, among others. So. That really, I think, um, that really was a standout year for for FASA and also for us as a result of the success of those books. Adam Levy, what is the impact on a transit publishing house when you get a Nobel Prize winner? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, in the short term, uh, 
it's it's uh, a lot of crazy days. Um, we're um, we're really working closely with our distributors and with our printers to stay on top of demand. I think we were really lucky in some sense that we had uh, two new books of his um, that were scheduled to come out in October uh, of this year. And so as a result, we had a lot of stock available. Um, still, we ran out, we sold out of that stock within 24 hours of the Nobel announcement and our website was totally flooded with orders that we're still trying to figure out how we're going to fulfill. Um, but, you know, obviously it's it's incredible for a press of our size, um, this kind of national recognition that, that we've received, that Jan has received. Um, it really, I think, raises the profile both of his work, um, not just the, these most recent books, but his entire backlist, um, and also of the press and the work that we do really... Um, allowing us to shine a light on all of the international literature that we've been championing since we started the press in 2015 and all of the work that is that is to come on our list next year and beyond so we'll see we'll see what it what um what it what it means for us um a couple of months down the line but right now it's really it's exciting and we're we're um we're in a happy kind of madness stage adam levy the big new york houses of course have sophisticated distribution systems how do you get your books out? Uh, we also have a sophisticated distribution system. We work with a uh, with um, a distribution company called Consortium, which is owned by Ingram. Um, so they have a, a central warehouse in Tennessee. So our books usually ship from our printers to their central warehouse, where they are. You know, they move through the supply chain. Uh, to field retailers, which are independent bookstores and national accounts like Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, we also have a really wonderful team of sales reps through consortium um, that work with our, our field accounts um, to sell our books in each season. So, you know, we, we don't have quite the, the size and the, the robustness of the, uh, the infrastructure of a, a big five house, but um, we still have a, a really excellent team getting our books out into the world. Will you be going to Stockholm in December? Yeah, yes, I, I will be. Uh, there's, um, yes, we'll be there. Um, I will be wearing the the one tuxedo that I have. I thought I would never have occasion to wear after last year's National Book Awards, but I'm really glad to have occasion to bring it out of the closet again. Now, your son is also involved in the company in a sense, correct? Yes, he is. Um, he's not exactly on the payroll. He's four years old, um, but he was instrumental in the starting of our children's book imprint, uh, Transit Children's Editions. I don't think that we, I think we got into it like many others do um we were reading picture books with our son this is probably when he was about two years old we got the idea um or we, we kind of were struck with the curiosity of what the children's book landscape looked like for international literature in the way that we had the same kind of curiosities um and, and frustrations even with the adult landscape um when we were starting the the adult list. So we we started putting out some feelers, writing to some agents, um, doing a little research of our own. And not long after, we started signing picture books um, from around the world. And our son has been a really wonderful uh, first reader for all of our children's books. Um, I think one thing that's really been helpful is that it's easy to read children's literature um, and kind of confuse yourself that it's a, that these are books for adults and not for kids. And the kids are the people who you need to entertain and challenge and also not to underestimate because they're, they have brilliant little sponge minds. And um, our son has, you know, he has really surprised us in the kind of books that he's been excited about the kind of humor that he's, um, that that has made him laugh and the kind of books that he asks for in the morning. So, you know, just because of the ways that we structure our days, 
I'm usually up early and working um, in our little office here and he'll come out and ask me what kind of books um, I'm, I'm making. I'm not always making a book in the morning. Usually I'm answering, you know, dull emails, but um, he'll come out and we'll, we'll go through some of the submissions that I have uh, from children's book agents and editors. And, you know, he really, he really, I trust his, I trust his taste. And um, sometimes he likes some really ridiculous things that aren't right for our aesthetic, but it's okay. Um, it's been a lot of fun to be able to grow the list with him and we'll, we'll see where it takes us. Have you thought about moving into nonfiction as well? Uh, we do do nonfiction. We don't do um, kind of um, uh, like uh, history and things like that, but we, we have a, um, a narrative nonfiction series called Undelivered Lectures that we started in 2020, um, which are book-length essays that we largely commission um, from authors that we really admire. So that's actually been a, a fun project for us and a really nice compliment to the international literature on our list. The, the, um, the series features more American writers, still international as well. Um, but it allows us to have writers writing on a range of subjects that excite them and kind of stretch their legs a little bit in a new um, in a new medium or form. So that's been a, that's been a lot of fun to to um, get started and also to showcase kind of the breadth of what's possible within within a list like ours. And finally, one personal question: How do you and Ashley, as co-publishers, divide the work? And 24 7 living together and working together i mean it's always been the case for us i mean we met in graduate school and books and writing have always been kind of um part of the fabric of our lives in one way or the other whether we're reading books and talking about them or i'm reading her writing um or she's reading something that i've translated or with the press i mean it was um it always was something that we were able to talk about and get excited about um, I think my favorite way that we work together is when we're both editing um, editing a manuscript together because I think we have slightly different sensibilities when as, as editors. Um, so occasionally we'll both be in the we'll both be working on a manuscript. I'll do a pass. Um, she'll do a pass. I'll edit her pass. She'll edit my pass, and we'll send it back. It's possibly um, m- much more time consuming than it should be, but. Um, I think it it brings out the best in both of us, and together we are we are one one brain. Uh, so it's it's a really nice thing to be able to share that with your partner. One advantage and one disadvantage being three thousand miles away from New York City. Um, one advantage is that I find that the publishing industry out here, I mean, it's smaller, it's a lot more flattened. It you go to uh, literary events and there are booksellers and there are editors and there are magazine people. Um, there's the occasional agent. It, it doesn't feel as stratified as it is in New York um, where things are slightly more segmented by industry and function. Uh, it's also nice just to have a little more space. You don't have the, you know, the, the constant headache of, life in in a the big city it feels a little bit more relaxed here but it, but at the same time new york is the center of the publishing industry um and we're lucky in that my family is from new york so we go back several times a year um both for visits to family and for publishing reasons and so we we make um new york visits a part of our publishing life as well Adam Levy, along with his wife, Ashley Nelson Levy, are the co-publishers of Transit Books, which published a Nobel Prize winner for 2023. Congratulations. Thanks for being with us on C-SPAN's Book TV. Thank you so much. And you're watching About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. Well, dozens of books are published each week. Here's a few. Former Congresswoman Liz Cheney is out with Oath and Honor, a memoir, and a warning. The book is her account of the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol and her work on the January 6 Select Committee. Ms. Cheney was defeated in the Republican primary for her Wyoming seat in 2022. 
She said during her book tour that she's now considering a third party run for president in 2024. Also, Tim Alberta, an Atlantic staff writer and the son of an evangelical preacher, is out with his book, The Kingdom, the Power and the Glory, American Evangelicals in an Age of Extremism. Mr. Alberta's previous book, American Carnage on the Front Lines of the Republican Civil War and Rise of President Trump, was a New York Times bestseller. And finally, two new books on Civil War generals. Historian John Reeves released Soldier of Destiny, Slavery, Succession, and the Redemption of Ulysses S. Grant. It's Mr. Reeves' third book about Civil War generals. And University of Virginia history professor Elizabeth Varon took a new look at Confederate General James Longstreet in a book titled Longstreet, the Confederate General Who Defied the South. Well, also each week, new book reviews are published. Here's two of them. National Review senior writer Dan McLaughlin reviewed Democracy or Republic, The People and the Constitution. It's by American Enterprise Institute senior fellow Jay Cost. Mr. McLaughlin writes that the U.S. Constitution, quote, has a lot of enemies these days and too few friends. There is a surprising dearth of modern books defending it. Jay Cost is out to change that. He adds that Mr. Cost's, quote, main aim is to explain what the framers at Philadelphia in 1787 thought the Constitution would accomplish and why their design is still needed in today's world. In Mr. Cost's view, he writes, the overall philosophy of the framers can be summarized in one word, consensus. And one more book review, Kirkus Reviews, took a look at political reporter Ryan Grimm's study of New York Democrat Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her closest allies in Congress. The book is titled The Squad, AOC and the Hope of a Political Revolution. Kirkus calls the book, quote, an insider's often dismaying picture of national politics. On Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, Kirkus writes, quote, as AOC became a prominent media personality, She and the rest of the squad were increasingly targeted. AOC, whom Grimm portrays as a consensus builder and people pleaser, was thrust into the role of rebel, end quote. Well, this week on Book TV's Afterwards program, it's the Wall Street Journal's Jeff Horwitz. He talked about Facebook's growth as a tech company and the challenges that its platform has faced over time. Here's a look. And I had a hard time believing this at first when I saw these stats that um, essentially anything that damaged growth or daily usage. And when, when I say damaged, I mean literally reduced by 0.05%. Um, that was dead on arrival. You could not change the platform in ways that reduced usage. That was just simply not allowed ever. Um, and in fact, as Facebook's growth slowed, um, uh, those rules got even more stringent, right? Like anything that would decrease any metric that was related to usage was just dead on arrival. Um, and, uh, you know, the company talked about hard trade-offs, right, between various things, but the one thing that it never traded off was its own growth. And, um, uh, you know, that's, I think, a, a pretty challenging environment to work in. And I think one of the reasons why not just Francis, but a whole bunch of other employees got disaffected and walked. Um, I mean, I think to some degree, the book that I wrote is um, was only possible because Facebook Meta brought in a whole bunch of extremely smart people, told them to work on things that were clearly societally important, where lives were at stake, Uh you know, ask them for solutions. They came up with solutions and then Meta said, thanks, but we don't really want to do that. And a reminder that Afterwards airs every Sunday at 10 p.m. on Book TV. Well, thanks for joining us on About Books, a program and a podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. We'll continue bringing you publishing news and author programs and a reminder that you can get this podcast on the C-SPAN Now app. You can also watch any of our programs online anytime at booktv.org.